Hello. Welcome, welcome. Okay, I'm fixing this. There we go. Okay, so today we are talking about the science of cannabis. <laughs> and I am a scientist Mel, so I want to welcome you to our live streaming video cast. Hey, how are you, Aristo? Hello, AE, Atheist Engineer. So, today I'm going to talk about cannabis. We're going to talk about what it does. We're going to talk about the cellular receptors. Oh, I'm good. This was a topic. If you're new to um, my video cast, I post a poll on Twitter and people get to vote on what they want to hear in regards to what kind of topics. And so they voted on cannabis. So I'm going to talk about all the different things related to research in cannabis and how it affects us, what, you know, what it does exactly, um, all the different receptors or cellular receptors, and that's kind of integral to the research that I do. So this will be pretty interesting, I think. So I'm Scientist Mel. There's my self-portrait, you know, because I have clown lips in this picture. So, <laughs> so let's get started on the science of cannabis, okay? And feel free to ask me questions throughout our little video cast because that's the whole point is to be able to ask me questions while we're going through it. So, got a green leaf here. So the science of cannabis, what is it? Well, we have to talk a little bit about cellular communication through what we call cell receptors. Now, every single cell in your body has little antenna that stick out of it. Okay, so we have like antennas on our houses where we're able, well, used to back in the day when you had the antennas on your house. Some people have satellite dishes, you know, in order to get information. This is how cells talk to each other. So first thing we have to do is talk a little bit about cell communication and cell receptors in order to understand exactly what cannabis does and how, you know, it affects us and makes us feel the way we do. All right. So, you have something called the cannabinoid system, okay? And these are just about different parts all over your body. You have receptors that receive information from cannabinoids, and we'll talk about what those are in just a second, that cause your cells to respond a certain way. So these compounds that we find in cannabis fire off these particular cell receptors and they initiate different responses in the cells and then you start to have the feelings that you do. So let's take a look at a very rudimentary drawing. So let's pretend that this is a cell, any kind of cell in your body, all right? And this is the membrane of the cell on the outside. It could be a body cell or a brain cell. And you have these little receptors on the outside of your cell. Okay, we have these little receptors that kind of look like little antenna, right? Now, the cannabinoids, these are the different compounds that are inside cannabis. They attach to these receptors, and then what happens is it starts a chain reaction of all kinds of different biochemical processes that go on within the cell, and then the cell starts to generate proteins, and then you start to have these feelings. Hello, those of you who have joined. We're talking about the science of cannabis today, an Albertosaurus. Hello, everybody. So, cannabinoids, these are the different chemicals like THC, and I'm going to show you some of those compounds and what those look like. They fire off and attach to these receptors, and this starts all of those little reactions within the cells that have us feel the way we do when we are indulging in cannabis. So, a bit more information how these receptors work. You got your Doritos, woohoo! All right, so I already kind of showed you a basic drawing of what it is. So this is like a nerve cell. So these cannabinoids attach to these receptors, and in this case, it's like the most active ingredient when we're looking at THC. That's the psychoactive compound within cannabis that gives you those feelings. All right, but there are other compounds that are inside cannabis that have been shown to be kind of beneficial. And so, once this cannabinoids attach to our little receptors here, it initiates that type of response. And so, these nerve cells then communicate with each other through these chemical messages across their contacts. So, we talked last time about the science of the brain. 
Okay, you remember? We actually talked about the science of the brain. I still have my skull here. <laughs> and how nerves talk to each other and neurons talk to each other through this way. So this kind of initiates the response between each of these cells. So that's why it hits you. It takes a little while to hit you a little bit because those pathways have to fire off and talk to each other, right? Okay, so now let's talk about what these receptors are called. So those little antenna that are on the outside of your cell, we have CB1 and CB2, two different types of receptors. CB1 is found all in your nervous system and in your connective tissues. Your connective tissues would be, for instance, your blood, and you also have another connective tissue, would be like your muscles. Um, those sorts of things are considered connective tissues because they connect to each other, right? They connect to something. So we're talking about connective tissues. They're also found in your glands. So all of your different glands, like your pituitary glands and hypothalamus and that sort of thing, um, and also in your organs, all right? CB2, that receptor that um, attaches to certain compounds within cannabis is found in your immune system and other periphery structures. So other types of structures that are spread out all over your body, all right? Now let's get all chemistry-like. We're gonna look at all these compounds here. All right, so these are the four main compounds that you find within cannabis. All right, the primary one being THC. Now this fires off the CB1 receptor. And THC is the most common found in um, cannabis, as well as CB1 being prevalent throughout your body. It's 10 times more prevalent, especially in your brain. I believe it's 10 times, that's what I read. So we've got the CB1 receptor, which is the one that most attaches with THC. Hey, Michael. And this is kind of the structure of what it looks like. This is all, this is all chemistry looking, isn't it? But it's psychoactive. That's the one that causes you to feel the way that you do um, in regards to cannabis. This one, let's see this one here. All right, this one is CBN. This attaches to the one associated with your immune system. So this is the one that's your organs, that's all over your body, ignite the green. <laughs> And then this is the one that is more of in your immune system, all right, your CB2. Now, we have something here called CBD. This has indirect effects, but it doesn't really fit in the other two receptors so well. But over time, THC, if it's, a, if it's subjected to heat or, you know, over time, it'll kind of convert to this non, um, not really active form. Um, they are still studying it for possible medical benefits, but we still don't know a whole lot about this one. Now this one here, this is found in the younger plants as they're starting to grow and you take it from budding marijuana plants. Um, so this is uh, a non-intoxicating version, so it's not psychoactive, but it may have other benefits that they're studying for medical purposes. So let's talk about the different parts of the brain that's affected by cannabis. So we have our cerebral cortex. So this plays a role in memory. So some people forget things from time to time when they are on cannabis. Our hypothalamus, which governs the metabolic processes. So your appetite. This is why some people get a little bit hungry when they're on that. So it affects that. Um, then we have the amygdala, so that kind of plays a role in emotions. The hippocampus, that's again memory. Notice we're, we're getting a lot with the memory, aren't we? So we have all of these different components of the brain. Basal ganglia, cerebellum, cerebellum is back here. So we have these different components of the brain that are affected, <laughs> knocking it out of the park. <laughs> Woohoo! Yay! So we have all these different por portions of the brain that are affected by cannabinoids. And primarily the receptor that you find heavily in this is the CB1, which is sus um, susceptible primarily to THC. So the THC compound, which has the psychoactive effects, are the ones, is, is the one that you primarily have um, interacting with the receptors here. 
So let's talk about some of the side effects of cannabis, all right? So here's some side effects. Now there are pros and cons to this, so we're gonna kinda talk about the cons a little bit. You know, memory loss. Now short-term use, short-term use within grown adults, there's not so much in the way of memory loss. It's for a long-term use that this becomes problematic. Lower IQs are associated only with those individuals that started in adolescence. Now, these are all still relatively new types of studies, and so there would need to be much more research, especially on the long-term effects, and possibly that can be done now that it's legal in several states. So it raises, now there's conflict, I should say, there's conflicting research on this. So it raises risks for some to schizophrenia. So if schizophrenia runs in your family and you're not already affected by it, you might want to avoid it because it might trigger you into schizophrenia. That could be an environmental thing, but there's conflicting research on this right now because in some research, people who suffer from schizophrenia actually benefit from cannabis. So a lot is still not known in regards to that. So let's talk about some beneficial side effects. <laughs> some beneficial side effects would be that it slows aging. Oh, my paper is not coming up on here. Okay, so here, it slows aging. Lower IQ is bogus. Well, there's conflicting reports, but that is only with still developing humans. So you have to keep that in mind. If you're an adolescent and you have and you start smoking anything, anything, it doesn't matter what it is. If you start drinking or smoking anything like that while you're still developing, that's where it's problematic. So you, you, that's why we know we have a much higher drinking age, like 21 and stuff. So um, anytime you start sooner while you're still developing, you run the risk of not completely developing properly if you're exposing yourself to psychoactives. So, yes, I, that's why I said smoking in adolescence. There's nothing that associates that with already there. So, yes, I'm gonna get to that in a second with the medical about bipolar, okay? Other psychoses. So, beneficial side effects. It slows aging your brain. There have been studies that have associated having um, THC actually slows the aging of brains, and especially in Alzheimer's. Okay, prior to about 25, it does have cognition effects. Okay, so beneficial side effects again. Um, smoking, some studies show that there's a drop in an aggression with people who are on the spectrum for autism. So there are some people who suffer autism where it's very profound and they self-harm. They have shown that in a few cases, there needs to be more research with this, but in a few cases, it lowers the aggression to where they're much calmer. And so that helps them to be able to, um, you know, especially with their caregivers, to be able to manage them a bit better, and they're able to communicate a bit better. So, PTSD, yes, that's another good one. Also, especially when you're dealing with individuals who are suffering from HIV infection and cancer, it can increase their appetite to help them eat a bit more, as a lot of the treatments involving cancer and HIV are nausea-inducing, the effect, beneficial side effect, is the hunger aspect to be able to help them to develop an appetite so they can eat something and get nutrition and take better care of themselves. So I'm gonna show you a terribly, chemo too, exactly. This is a terribly, like got lots of big words in it and stuff, but essentially this is has to do with neurodegenerative diseases. So I'm just gonna hold it up for a second and then I'm gonna take it down and explain to you what all these words mean. So we've got cannabis plants here, all kinds of different cannabis plants, and we've got some fancy words. So I'm gonna to explain to you what these mean. So essentially, one thing that happens, especially with Alzheimer's, is you have a neurodegenerative type of situation where you have a large amount of certain proteins and macromolecules. Hey, Tardis lizard. Tardis lizard is actually an RL friend of mine. So, <laughs> so you're dealing with, um, with Alzheimer's, you might have proteins that are present that cause degeneration of nervous tissue. 
And then you also have those connections between the neurons that um, can kind of degrade over time. So you have less cellular communication. And then you also have inflammation where these um, neurons become inflamed. And we know inflammation when we see it in forms of fevers. We see it whenever we have um, swollen throat, you know, from being sore. Well, that can happen with your neurons in your head. So, um, and also, cannabis, the THC component primarily, works as an antioxidant. Same is true for Huntington. That one makes sense. I actually know a bit about Huntington's. I should probably do a genetic disease periscope sometime. I know a bit about genetic disorders with humans, so that'd be interesting, genetic diseases. So, and you also have what's called cognitive decline. So, when you're dealing with brain tissue, degenerating, shrinking, going away, connections between your two neurons. So as you age, you have these problems. Cannabis and the THC associated with it actually has an antioxidant effect, neuroprotectant, anti-inflammatory. So we know we have the swelling when you say, oh, my throat is inflamed. Well, brain tissue can do that too. So cannabis has an effect on aging brains in this regard to where it can also clear out some of these excess macro molecules that can kind of build up in your head and contribute to Alzheimer's. So, and it can kind of repair or prevent age-related deficits that happen in the brain. So that's essentially what this really fancy diagram is right there, is all of that that I just said. <laughs> I'll put these up on my Twitter account so you can see them later. So, some medical research on cannabis. So, things that they're currently researching to try to see if there's any partic particular benefit. Anxiety. Lots of people suffer from this sort of thing. You have high-functioning anxiety. You have debilitating anxiety. You have anxiety where you can't leave your house. And you have the anxiety where you play with your hair and you're quietly coping and people don't notice. So you have all kinds of different anxieties. So there's research being done as using cannabis as a treatment for that. Okay, so you have also substance use disorders. Some people have a really hard time breaking... Um, um, an addiction to a particular substance. So cannabis is one option that they're looking for in order to help people break that addiction. Psychosis. So we were mentioning before different types of ailments that regard bipolar, um, PTSD, all of these different things that have affected individuals. PTSD actually has a lot of anxiety associated too, but keep in mind, these are highly individual um, diseases or highly individual Im impairments that people suffer. So it's really hard to just say this is this this one thing will fix everything. Well, no, it's it's not all that. All of these are kind of spectrum based and which part are you on? Where are you at in regards to that you have early stage Alzheimer's, you have late stage Alzheimer's, you have the same with cancer, you have varying degrees of psychosis. So that's why more research needs to be performed in order to understand just to, you know where on that line do we need to start instituting this type of treatment and that comes from your doctor and that comes from also whatever the current research is in regards to that so there's studies that are being done right now but one thing that the CDC wants to do, as well as the FDA, is to study the long-term effects of that. But now that it's legal in several states, they're able to determine, and they'll be able to have these types of research done in order to see the long-term effects of cannabis on, an, on a, a sample size of people. Because we, we can't just say, oh, this is 100 people. You need a much larger sample size than that in order to definitively say, hey, this is how it's going. <laughs> So let's talk a bit about drug-related injuries and overdose statistics. So the NIH, they do, um, they work a lot with the CDC in regards to um, analyzing different trends in populations when it comes to diseases and drug addiction and drug abuse. So in 2014, 17,465 overdoses were associated with heroin and cocaine. And then we have 25,760 overdosed on prescription drugs. So these were drugs that were <laughs> prescribed by a doctor that, that people overdosed on. But look at this one. 30,700 
alcohol related deaths. Now when I say related deaths, that doesn't mean just overdose. That's also car accidents, driving, drunk accidents, that sort of thing. So 30,700 alcohol related deaths. In 2014, not a single person overdosed on marijuana. That's an actual statistic by the NIH from 2014. There has been a rise a bit in these other numbers, but they haven't really seen anything in regards to marijuana overdose. Now, I do need to say there's not enough data or sample size to determine, you know, the effects of marijuana related to accidents, driving, etc., that sort of thing. You know, the increased use may prove to increase these types of accidents. We just don't know because, you know, we can't definitively say this car accident, you know, now it's just, there's just not enough data. So now that it's legal in several states, we'll be able to say, hey, this person was on this particular drug, THC, cannabis, whatever, and then they got in the car and they got in a car accident. But as of right now, there's not a lot of reports regarding that. So that's a plus. So I need to also say, well, there's no significant problems that seem to arise from short term use of adults, of adults, on uh, with marijuana um, there needs to be long-term studies need to be performed in order to definitively show the long-term effects that are associated with cannabis use so again since it's only legal in states just for a handful of years we'll now be able to do these long-term effects but it's going to take some time as far as these studies but the good news is, is things seem to be going all right so far <laughs> so I will end with this if it's legal in your state enjoy responsibly so, enjoy responsibly if medicinal why so few studies well only because well I mean there are legal reasons you could volunteer for the long term study. so that's a good that's a good question so it's hard to get a sample size of people that are willing to say hey yeah I'm on pot get me down and you know I'll let you study me over the next five years. You're kind of tagging yourself, especially if it's if it's illegal in the majority of the country. Now, if it's in a legal state, then they're like, okay, we're likely to have more individuals willing to step up and have us study them. Yes, if it's legal in your state, enjoy responsibly. That's the only thing that helps your sister's back pain. Well, you know, there are those CB1 receptors all over your body, including connective tissue. So if her back pain is related to a muscle type of issue, then yes, her um, muscle tissues will be response, will respond to those cannabinoids because that's the CB1 receptor. That's the one that's the psychoactive receptor that is primarily 10 times more of that receptor in your brain. So that's why you feel it like that. And then also the appetite, everything that's kind of regulated in regards to pain and stuff like that is associated with your brain. And you go volunteer in a study. Yeah, see, TARDIS lizard with me. So if it is legal in your state, and you should go and volunteer to be part of a study to help broaden the base, the knowledge base of cannabis, cannabinoids, and what they do and their potentials. And without the nasty side effects of opiates, yes, there's been an increase of um, problems associated with opiates. Um, I can shoot the link to that with all of those studies involving the NIH. Um, it was actually featured, actually found a really nice Huffington Post article, but it posted all of the graphs, links to the studies that they've done, and um, all of the trends associated with that. So it's actually very um, user, you know, reader friendly for lay people who don't under, you know, who, who aren't like sciencey types, heavy sciencey folks. So I found it quite an easy read and this graphs were very straightforward. So a lot of times you go on the internet, <laughs> user friendly. Yes, I have had to do um, read papers where I've had to spend an hour looking up terminology and I'm, you know, and I'm a scientist. So <laughs> I understand completely, but the thing that's important is to make sure you check the sites that you get your information because not every 
study is going to be reputable and not every study is going to be definitive and so the ones that say more research is needed you know for this to definitively prove that then that'll be good <laughs> so Luke Skywalker ignites the green in episode 8 oh my goodness <laughs> so do you guys have any other questions because I've put together I like to, I don't have a PowerPoint. I think PowerPoint would be weird. I think this is way more fun. So, this has been the science of cannabis. CB1, CB2 receptors. THC fires off the CB1 receptor that makes you feel the way you do. Has anti-brain aging effects. Um, doesn't really show to be harmful short-term use in grown adults. But, don't start it when you're an adolescent. It's going to mess you up It'll me it, there's proof to show that it messes you up. <laughs> it's not legal in my state. <laughs> but thanks for stopping by. I will be back next week. I'm going to put a poll up on Twitter for what you want to talk about. People have already thrown me topics. So I'm going to put them on a poll. And you guys get to vote about what I'm going to talk about next. It's been enlightening. Fantastic. All right. Well, you guys have a super awesome Saturday. And I'll see you on Twitter. Thanks for hopping aboard. Bye.